you want to turn in your Bible this evening, uh, I would uh, invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians. And uh, uh, let's, uh, let's go to chapter 12 first. We're going to be looking. I've been reading in 2 Corinthians recently. In fact, I, I finished the book. But uh, just wanted to share a few thoughts with you. Before I do so, let me just remind you that uh, all humanity, whether you're a lost person or saved, all humanity are God imagers. All human beings are made in the image of God. We are God imagers. That is what the Bible teaches. However, if you're saved, God has started a process in every believer's heart the very moment you're saved, and that process is to make you more like himself. And the Holy Spirit, and I say this reverently, is the superintendent of construction on this project that's your life. And it's his business to bring you to a place where you look more and more like Jesus. The tool that I believe that the Holy Spirit uses as much as any other tool to perform this building project, this renovation project, is trials and suffering. And I'm thinking about Romans chapter 8, the whole context of the second half of the book, uh, uh, of the second half of the eighth chapter of Romans is suffering. He says in verse 18, for example, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to, to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And then he goes on and he says in this same uh, chapter, down in verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good. This is in the context of suffering. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And now he gives, he gives the reason or the purpose for which all things work together for good. Here it is. For whom he... For whom God foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that his son might be the firstborn among many brethren. There are a few ways in which God uses this tool of suffering to conform believers to the likeness of Jesus. And I'd like to share a few of those with you. I've had you uh, turn, first of all, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll look at that in just a moment before we pause here and have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this time that we have together. And in these devotional thoughts that we'll share now, I pray that you would speak. And Lord, that uh, you, would, uh, you would wrap our attention and that you would grab hold of our hearts, and Lord, that you would insert into our minds, our hearts, precisely what you want us to have tonight. Lord, may we not be distracted, but may we be focused. We pray that you would glorify your name in these lives. Lord, the only reason you give us breath, the only reason this, this uh physical heart beats within our chest is because we're yours and we're here for you. And Lord, uh, everything that pertains to us is for your glory. And so we pray tonight that uh, you would use this, answer some questions that you might, uh, that we might have in our minds. But Lord, most of all, we just pray that you would draw us close to you and cause us to trust you and not um, even question what you allow into the sphere of our circumstances because you are too wise to make a mistake and you are too loving 
to ever do your children harm. And we know that all things work together for good. And so we thank you for that truth and pray now for your Holy Spirit to take the truth home deep into our hearts in Jesus name. Amen. So a few ways I want to share with you from the book of 2 Corinthians that God uses suffering to conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus. And, you know, suffering takes a lot of different forms, but the suffering that Paul uh, suffered and that he was talking about in the book of 2 Corinthians was suffering that came as a result of living the Christian life and presenting Jesus to other people. I've had you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 because I want you to realize that uh, that suffering is meant to build your trust in the Lord. That is, it's meant to build your trust so that you can then become the recipient of his strength and his power in your life right in the midst of suffering. I believe that God uses suffering in our lives to bring humility to our hearts. Suffering promotes humility. You know, I I think that this is a misconception that that really uh, came home to me when I was reading 2 Corinthians. And uh, if you can keep a finger in chapter 12, go back to chapter 1 a moment. I think the misconception that I want to correct tonight from the scripture is this. It's been said that God never gives us more suffering than we can bear. But I want you to see what Paul says in this first chapter of 2 Corinthians. He says, uh, for example, in uh, verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, listen to this, we were pressed out of measure, above strength, meaning human, inasmuch that we despaired even of life. We didn't think we're going to make it. We had the sentence of death in ourselves. Here's why, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. And I want to say to you on that note that at times God deliberately allows more suffering than you and I can bear. Severe suffering, extreme suffering, intense and persistent and relentless suffering. God deliberately gives us more than we can endure ourselves because the biggest roadblock, the biggest barrier to holy living and fruitful ministry or service for the Lord is our self-life, is our selfishness. And God is in the business of conforming us into Christ's likeness. And as a result, the self-life in me and in you and in believers must be broken in order for God to have unhindered life through us. Christian living and effective service involves humility, and that is a brokenness. So God, he pours it on. You've heard the the saying, uh, when uh, when it rains, it pours, and God does that. He gives us more than we can bear so that he breaks us, so that he humbles us and breaks us for the reason that Paul gives in verse 9, that we would stop trusting in ourselves. And instead, we would trust in God who has the ability to raise the dead. He said, I had the sentence of death in me, but I'm trusting the God that raises the dead. Resurrection power. And so God allows suffering to reveal his power in our lives 
And he does that, first of all, by bringing humility to us. And through that humility, then he is able to work in us dependency. And by that, I mean what he says in that ninth verse, trusting not in ourselves, but in the God that raises the dead. God breaks the self-life through suffering so that you and I learn to rely on him and not ourselves. He builds uh, dependence, God dependence in our lives. And now, if you'll turn back to that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I want you to see Paul's own testimony of how God took him, broke him, brought him to humility, and then built real dependency in his life. In the God that raises the dead, in verse 7 of chapter 12, he said, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, which was really the messenger of Satan to buffet me, to pummel me, lest I should be exalted above measure. In fact, it was so bad, verse 8, I prayed three times that this might depart from me, this thorn in my flesh might be taken from me. Oh God, please. But his answer, God's answer in verse 9, he said to me, my grace, you might say my strength or my power is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made complete in human weakness. And so Paul changed his tune. Most gladly, therefore, Instead of asking for him to take this away from me, I will glory, I'll boast in my infirmity, in my weakness. Why? That the power, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That the, 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 the power of the one that raises the dead might rest upon me. So I take pleasure in my weakness, in my infirmities, in my reproaches, in my in all my suffering. I take I take pleasure in that because when I am humbled, when I am broken, then I depend upon the Lord and he gives me his strength. So one of the ways that the Lord uses suffering to conform us to Christ is that we might experience his power. Go back to 2 Corinthians 1 again with me. And here's a second thing, a second way that suffering is used by God to conform us to Christ. I want you to go back to verses uh, 4 and 5 of uh, this uh, first chapter. He says, um, well, first of all, verse 3, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who, this God of all comfort, comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. What does that all mean? Let me put it in different words for you. God comforts us in all of our troubles for the reason that we then can comfort other people, so that we can comfort other believers. For the more that we suffer for Christ, the more he showers us with that comfort through Christ. God uses suffering to develop compassion in us to make us a people that are filled with pity for others. The more that you personally suffer, what he says in that fifth verse basically is, the more that you personally suffer, the more God will shower his comfort in your life. And how does he do that? through God himself that is in us, who is called the comforter, right? The comforter is within us. 
And the more that you suffer and then look to God, the more he will shower you with his comfort through the comforter that is within you. And you will begin to experience the tenderness of God in your life. It's a personal thing that he wants to cause compassion to develop through our suffering. Compassion for others. Now, some people are more naturally compassionate than others. I find in my own experience, in my own home, uh, my wife is much more compassionate than I am. I've learned a lot about compassion just on a natural level uh, by being married to my wife because I'm not naturally that compassionate. She's very compassionate. And as a result, has impacted me over these years of marriage. And just I'm I've become more compassionate just by having her as my wife. But this is a different level of compassion that we're talking about here. This is a supernatural compassion that God gives to people. And, and it is a passion, a compassion for others that you experience personally so that you can share it mutually one with another. It's the thing that we need to bless others with more than anything else, more compassion. When you suffer, you learn to be sympathetic to others. I mean, just on a natural level, if you suffer some disease perhaps, and then you come in contact with another person that is suffering that same disease or those same symptoms, you certainly have more sympathy for them than you otherwise would. So when you suffer for the Lord, you learn then to sympathize with others more easily because you have a personal idea of what they're experiencing. Did you know that even Jesus, even Jesus developed compassion as our high priest by the things that he suffered for us? And uh, I say that on the basis of the book of Hebrews. He says uh, several things about the Lord. He says, we don't have a high priest that can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities or our weaknesses. And uh, he goes on to say, in the days of his flesh, he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. He knows what it is. Though he were a son, yet learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So even Jesus in his humanness, in his human earthly life, he learned, uh, uh, he developed compassion, you might say, as our high priest by the things that he suffered for us. And you can learn to rely on Jesus that by his grace, you can experience his personal comfort, and then you will be able to share that comfort that God gave you with others that need it at that time. Rather than thinking of suffering as something that limits our opportunity to minister to other people, it actually increases our ability to minister. Suffering doesn't hinder, but actually increases our ability to, to minister to other people. It opens doors that we would otherwise not have. Perhaps you've heard of the uh, woman missionary, Amy Carmichael. Uh, Amy Carmichael gave her life to missions, and most uh, of her incredible life-saving work was done in India, where she rescued little children from the Hindu temple from prostitution, and she founded a home in an orphanage and, uh, and rescued uh, thousands of these children. But throughout all of her amazing journeys and, and uh, ministry for the Lord, she was always enduring some sort of physical pain. For most of her life, she suffered from a nerve condition called neuralgia, which caused her chronic pain and fatigue and, and migraine headaches. And then due to a spine injury, she was bedridden and in severe pain for the last 20 years of her life. It was during those bedridden years that she wrote many letters to friends and many books 
in fact, she wrote 35 books about her work as a missionary, and many of them ministered deeply to the spiritual needs in people's hearts and lives. What I'm trying to say is that this woman missionary, as a result of her suffering, had a door of opportunity to minister in a greater way than she ever had before. You say, what can a bedridden, a pain-filled believer do? Why would God leave them on a bed of pain? Why not take them home? Because he's not done with them. And because rich ministry can flow out of that if we depend upon his power that I mentioned a little bit ago. If we don't rely on ourselves, but on his power, he builds, he gives us power, he builds pity or compassion in our lives. And there's a third thing that I want to say that uh, God uses suffering to conform us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is from chapter 6 in the book of 2 Corinthians. And in chapter 6 and uh, verse 16, the second part of it, he says this. He says to believers, you are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and be their God and they'll be my people. Suffering not only reveals God's power in the believer's life and builds God's pity in the believer's life, but it also is a door into the very presence of God in a believer's life. I think that in suffering, God comes close. His presence becomes a real thing in uh, the believer's life. In suffering, God comes close in your heart. I think that suffering is a constant reminder that we're living in a broken world, that this world is broken, but it has not been abandoned by God. The psalmist says in Psalm 147 in verse 3, that it is God that heals the brokenhearted. It's God who comes close. God's with you in your suffering. In fact, no one is as close to any believer in their suffering as the Lord himself. Think about it. God left heaven. He left his heavenly abode. He came down to this earth. He suffered as a man. And he suffered in your place. And he took the suffering that you deserve as your substitute. It is the very presence of Christ in the believer that sanctifies our suffering. The psalmist also said in the 119th Psalm, he said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. He said that he thanked God for his affliction, because through it, he learned God's word. So you see, suffering reveals the very presence of God, not only in your heart, but that he's close to your heart. I believe that God holds his children very close to his heart when they suffer, as they look to him, as they depend upon him for strength they begin to experience the tremendous tenderness of God to them. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But listen to how the psalmist puts it in Psalm 34. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. He saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. I remember many years ago when I was really a very young pastor, I was called upon to visit an invalid man, a bedridden man. Uh, his wife and his daughter were not believers. They were religious, but they were not believers. But in my conversation with this man, uh, I found out very quickly that he was a believer. And uh, he couldn't even, he couldn't get out of bed. And... Uh, he looked forward to my visits, and I went there as often as I could to minister to him. But often when I left there, I felt like he had ministered to me. He was a man that had endured a lot of physical suffering for many years. 
and uh, had been successful in life, but in his later years had been bedridden for so long. And I remember uh, praying with him and uh, he would pray. And I'll never forget because every time he prayed, uh, you could just uh, you could just sense the Lord uh, putting his arms around this man and being there for him because he would say, oh, Lord, come close, Lord, come close. Now, a man that was in, in great pain, I remember him, him just uh, at times just uh, writhing in pain when I was there visiting him and just uh, have these pains just come over him. But come close, Lord. I never forgot that. And sometimes I repeat that, that I learned from that man so many years ago. Lord, come close. Let me sense your presence at this time. And he is. He is close to those that suffer. He conforms believers into his image. That's the building project that God's doing in your life. And his biggest tool, I'm telling you, is suffering. Because through suffering, you experience his power if you look to him. You learn his pity in your life. And you will know his presence in a way that otherwise you'd never experience. The tender presence of the Lord when he comes close to you in this suffering.